you for doing this, by the way. Just You're welcome. I'm not sure I should tell you that. You're welcome. Good morning. Today is Friday, December 27th. I have, uh, my name is Mitchell Myers. I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing Steve Guto for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Good morning and happy Hanukkah. Back at you. Thank you very happy much. Hanukkah. So will you tell me your full name? Or Gamlaka, if you want to do it either, you want to do it Texan. Neither one is good for me. My full name, my formal full name? Yeah. Stephen Howard Guto. And do you know why your parents selected that name for you? Either of those names? I think I might, but it's going to take some effort. Uh, my name was Shlomo in Hebrew. I, I, I don't know the Howard. I only know that. That's okay. And uh, where were you born? When and where were you born? I was born February 25th, 1949 in Baylor Hospital. Florence Nightingale was the, the place uh, in Dallas. Texas. Very nice. And were your was your mom and dad from Dallas, or did they move here from somewhere else? They moved here. They they grown up both of them and fell in love in Detroit. But my mama was born in Toronto and lived there for about five years. And my dad was born in Newark and didn't live there. I don't think all that long. Not five years. Uh, and they their their parents and families came. To, so tell to me, Detroit, not to Dallas. From from Detroit to Dallas. Uh, my no. I'm sorry, my grandfather and grandmother had moved from, um, from Poland, Poland, Russia, uh, to, to Newark. And then at a very young age of my father, that family moved to Detroit. My, dad was, my granddad was a butcher. My mother, her parents were, her mother was born in Scotland. Uh, and she moved to Toronto. And uh, she married a guy named William Shankman, who I don't know because he died pretty young, but he's my grandfather. And um, uh, the, they, they then moved to Detroit when my mother was five years old. Okay, I got it now. So let's go through this one more time. Tell me your grandparents' names on your father's side and your mother's side. My grandparents on my father's side were Abraham and Ruth and uh, Rose. Uh, and Guto is the last name on, on my father's side, but I... I, I could guess at her actual, you know, last name, but I just don't remember it. I think it was like Letterman, but I don't even use that. I okay. guess it's in there, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and my uh, grand, my grand um, mother, her name was Dorothy Shankman. I think Perlman was her maiden name, and she married this guy William Shankman, who, I, as I said, I didn't know because he died in a car accident at thirty-seven. Mm. Okay, and then tell me your mom and dad's name. My mom is named Ruth. Uh, Elaine um, Shankman, then Guto, born Shankman, then Guto. And my dad was Albert Guto. I don't know, I don't think he had a middle name actually. Okay. Any brothers and sisters? I do. I have uh, two brothers and one sister. Um, my oldest brother is Billy Guto, and he's about eight years older than I am. Um, he's a, you know, real involved in the city of Dallas in different ways, business and the Jewish world, he and his wife and Barbara and their kids. Uh, and then I have a brother and sister who both have passed. Uh, my, young, my youngest, the only person younger than me in my family was Andrew Guto, who I know you know because you all were friends. Um, and he died in a car accident in uh, Great Britain with his wife in 1992, a, truck, a drunken truck driver ran him over while they were riding their bike at the southern part of the island in Britain near Bath. And my older sister died about five or six years ago from a bout with a long bout with early onset Alzheimer's. Uh, but it was only in the last two or three years that she really couldn't didn't know who I was, at least, and probably most people were. And her name? Marcia Gail Guto. Marcia Gale. Andrew Julius Guto is Andy, my younger brother, uh, and my sister was Marcia Gail Guto, and the brother still alive is William Robert Guto Billy. Call him Billy. So, um, thanks for all that. Is that uh, too much? No, that's all great. That's good, good information. <coughs> so, I just... Now shift it back to you again, and uh, just talk about your childhood, uh, where you grew up, I guess, uh, elementary school years, and if you enjoyed it, the friends you made, talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I had a great childhood. I was born 
I'm not 100% sure at, at the date of my birth, but I think we had already moved to Preston Hall, uh, not Preston Hall, to University Park, and I lived on Centenary Drive, 4004. I don't remember yeah. that. And um, it was a you know relatively spacious home. Um, it was on the between Preston Road and Tulane, and I you know enjoyed the the block and the neighbors and the dogs we had. We had a dog named Fuzzy who protected me no matter what. Um, I had a woman who took care of me named Mrs. Seerad, who I don't know except by those you know those old uh, 35 millimeter rolls they used to take. And she was there. People said she was demanding and would not allow anyone but her to have control of me. They made jokes about Mrs. Seerad and me. And I went to a higher elementary school. First, I went to Mrs. Varner's, which was a private school in the neighborhood uh, that a lot of people went to. I don't remember, like I probably got through there by first grade, but it, it might have even gone to first grade there. But I then went to higher for about a year. And then I, we moved out to right near the Jewish Community Center. We moved to Mason Dells and St. Jude's. Uh, in fact, we were cat catty corner from each other, you and me, Mitch. And um, I um, went to Dealey for a semester because Arthur Kramer, which is still going on, which means it's going on a long time, um, it wasn't built yet. So I started for one semester, maybe maybe a year, the second grade in, in at Dealey, and then I went to Arthur Kramer for the rest of my elementary school life. Nice. And at this time, did you have a lot of family around? I know it was your mom and dad and your siblings, but were there other family members around? There were. Uh, my, my, dad's, um, my dad's two sisters lived here, um, and they had husbands and children. Um, my uncle, my uncle Irvin, Irwin, Irvin. Uh, he was married to my dad's sister, Irene, and they, their name was Yannick. And my cousins are named Robert Yannick and Mimi Yannick. They had two children. And they're still here, and they still are doing okay, I think. I don't see them a lot. It's no, there's no... I like them. You know, I just don't hang out that much with them. Uh, I don't live here, so when I come back, I tend to, you know, really limit... It's limited to how much you can do. Uh, I should see them. I, I feel a little guilty about that. But then... Also, my uh, my dad's younger sister, who died quite young, died in her twenties, uh, was named Evelyn, and she married Mervyn Goodman. Evelyn Guto married Mervyn Goodman. She died, she died about twenty-seven of cancer, and her two children were Albert Goodman, who was a, a soulmate kind of cousin. There's like a couple or three of those, in you know, in the world, uh, and uh, his sister Suzanne, and Suzanne's still around, and we. You know, we don't see each other enough. We see each other on Facebook, I suppose, and if we see each other on a family occasion. It's very rare, but I do love love her, and I really loved Albert. Uh, he died quite not too long ago, actually, of a of a ALS, of a bad illness. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, but so there was a lot of family around. Happy times, y'all. Yeah, to... yeah. We 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 all, we would go to Detroit, where my mom's sisters were. Um, quite often, maybe every year, as a little boy, a lot of trips. And then my, my mom's brother was in Columbus. We'd go there every now and then, or, or they'd come here. Or, you know, there's a lot of, my mother's mother would come stay with us every year for about three months, um, Dorothy uh, Shankman. And, um, and you know, my, my, my grandfather, A, my father's father, was, was orthodox and quite knowledgeable and <clears throat> scholarly and often at the Agudasaki, which I don't even know if it still exists, but it was the Orthodox shul, mm -hmm. he would take the place of the rabbi when the rabbi was out. And um, he was a sweet man, and my grandma Rose was a sweet woman, so there's a lot of that. So, were they, they, I take it they're very religious. Did that filter down to you and your siblings and your family uh, when you were growing up? I mean, there was a religion part of your growing up? It was very important, but I wouldn't say that anybody was that I, I mean maybe they were kosher I know we weren't um, uh, maybe my grandparents were kosher I don't, I don't think anyone else was but um, but you know we grew up in a conservative show um, sure Israel. Israel. Sure Israel. and which had a big part of my life I mean not just then but late but later um, so yeah no we, we, we you know I'm a rabbi you I don't know if you know that but I, I I'm, I'm very 
religious, but I'm not very, um, I'm not traditional. And I'm a Reconstructionist rabbi. Um, and I think Judaism has always been very broad. It's not been tied to strict halakha ever. But people don't know that. Really? They just presume that the way that our sort of Eastern European, you know, predecessors were, uh, was everything. And it wasn't. Like your grandfather. My grandfather. Although I, I think they were, must have been kosher, but I don't know that for sure. Okay, so it was a part of your life growing up, going to Kramer, and uh, now you're, gonna, you're entering your bar mitzvah years, your bar mitzvah at Chair of Israel. I was. And tell me about that. Was that fun? Was that good? Was that a stressful for you? I, I, I think it might have been stressful, but I, what I, what's odd to me is I don't remember it very well. I mean, I do remember it, and I do you know, kind of remember the event and the parties. Uh, we were sure sure this well, it was already where it is now. I didn't move from South Dallas when I was born. Um, but I, I don't have, you know I, know, I know it was hard to learn. Um, the Haftarah and the um, and the Torah reading. Uh, I don't know that I said the Torah reading. I don't know that we did that so much then. Um, I you know I was Judaism was very important to me. I was deeply into my like AZA chapter and my friends there are still my friends. Um, you and I became friends not so much because of the AZA chapter, but because your 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 oldest brother was a friend, but his his your next to oldest brother was like one of my best friends. And uh, we were right across the street, and I, I watched you grow up. Yeah, that you did. So uh, You used to be a little bit, then you were <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, let's talk about your friends and growing up in uh, junior high school. And uh, AZA, was that a part of your life? And, it was a big part. I was uh, the Olive Gadol of Kaplan, AZA. I had a lot of funny stories about that, to, 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 if I wanted to say them. Um, don't know. Uh, and um, I mean, I could. It's just, it just seems like a lot. And um, a lot of memories. And you know, we, we had a we had a group called uh, the Playboy Club, which was um, a little bit. It was a little shady. We wanted to be outside the purview of the Jewish community. And one of our members, Alvin Miller, you know, he's he was the one who kind of got this idea together. And, I suppose it wasn't shady, that's be the wrong word, but it was, you know, it was certainly counter-cultural, and it was a little revolutionary. We, but, but, but we were really mostly in ACA. It was, but Kaplan was the kind of, the crazy people in, in, not the, you know, we weren't the scholars, we weren't the normative, the, the people that wouldn't be at the country club so much. This was at least our self-perceptions and other people's perceptions. We were, we, we were out there. You were self-aware of that at, what, 15 years old, right? I mean, oh, yeah. you, you I was self-aware of that kind of stuff. Yeah, very nice. So uh, I've talked to uh, some people that grew up, you grew up with, and they talked about this, um, this Christmas Day classic. Can you touch on that a little bit or explain how that came about or what that means or what that means to you? Sure. We, we were all pretty deeply involved in sports. I wasn't one of the better athletes, but I was, you know, into it and pretty intense, um, competitive as it gets. Always competitive, I was. I mean, maybe the most competitive of the group, but until you came along. But uh, but I was out there. I mean, nobody would question that. Um, and then we decided we played football all the time. We loved football. We loved SMU, and we loved the Cowboys. <clears throat> and um, but we played at Kramer. We played at the Jewish Center. And then when we were about fourteen, uh, we went to the Jewish Center, I guess, and started playing there. We had one classic, not at the Jewish Center. It was at Preston Hollow Park, but almost all were at the Jewish Center. And uh, we started playing on Christmas Day, and it became a great ritual. We had um, we, we we had the teams were were, were were set up by myself, who was eventually called the commissioner, and a guy named Warren Kamen. But the two of us would meet on the night before the classic, after the late in the evening, and we'd come out the two of us, and we would announce the teams, and it was like a big deal. Um, doesn't happen now. The team, I don't even know how you, I, I came this last year, but I don't know how you formed the teams. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was you know, stories are legendary. There were a lot of newspaper stories uh, over the decades. We you know we had a big tenth, big twentieth, a big something else, a big fortieth, a big fiftieth. Uh, everybody would come together with their families and show up, and 
it was it was a pretty amazing thing. But you could actually follow the classic with the Dallas Morning News or, or the Texas Jewish Post, but either one of those. You could follow it because there were a lot of stories and so a lot of television stories of, of the classic. So it's it's actually an amazing thing. And I, I hadn't I hadn't been involved so much. I did come this year. Um, and what touched me was that Mitchell was that the people there really took it seriously, and they weren't any of the people that started it except you. I mean, not, you're the only one that plays that's, you know, of the, and you were, and you were, were not in the very initial group because you're 10 years younger than I am, and that was sort of, and I was the youngest person in my, among my friends. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it, it was a whole other group of children and grandchildren who took it very seriously. I'd love to see them keep it going because that was the that was the vision. Once we started having vision, uh, we didn't have vision when we started. We were just playing football, but it was it was it was pretty cool to watch it this year with all the seriousness and the intensity and the tension and you know you still you could still lose it, which I was excited about. I didn't, but I you didn't, it. but you, you could. So you said we. You can get this out of the thing if you need to. <laughs> We, you said we, so you, can you expand on that? Who's we? Who's the we that you were referring to? We was the this group of friends who mostly were from Kaplan ACA, not all, not all, uh, and uh, the the names of the people are like Mark Shore, and Michael Eisenberg, and my cousin Albert Goodman. Um, there was Pat Culpepper, who you know was the one non-Jew in the classic. <laughs> he, he tended to show up. Uh, Al Alvin Miller, um, I could go on. I mean, the we Stanley Friedman would come out once in a while. I mean, I don't know who you know who who's around Dallas now, but um, Mike Grossfeld showed up. Would always show up, um, and we were real, we were all real close. Um, we're not all real close now, but we're still there's still a core of us that are very close. Right. So we we all love each other, and you know we have this. We have a party the night before at the Shore House, and then we have the classic at the Christmas Day. We used to have a party afterwards, most often at the Gallant Home. This is before Michael had married Anne. And actually, you know, I'm a, I told you, I'm a rabbi, and we were, and I'm a Reconstructionist rabbi, so we do experimental things. So when they asked me one, one of the years to do something experimental, when it was, was around Passover, I wrote the classic Haggadah, because we did so many rituals with the classic that it actually served, it was like a Haggadah, it was like the story, the telling, and it was our rituals with Warren Cayman and I late at night with the announcements of the team. It was, um, it was as if we had a set of rules. Now, that, those rules don't seem to be there anymore, but it was pretty intense. We were all serious about those rules. You were serious about the game, and now it's more, it's not so much about the game for you and your friends, the we that you talked about. It's more about the friendships, right? It, 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 it's totally about the friendship, but it was always about the friendship. I mean, it was never not about the friendship, but, but the fact of the matter is it's now embedded in what we do, and the friendships matter. I mean, we love each other, and most of us aren't ashamed to use that word. As kids, I was probably the only one that would use it. But now everybody uses it. Everybody uses it. I'm exactly. I'm sure a lot of others used it too. I'm just. You know. No, that, that's great. It's been a big part of my life, and I appreciate you sharing that with everybody. Um, where'd you go to high school? Hillcrest. Hillcrest High School. And can you talk about your influences at high school? I think ch things changed after your bar mitzvah, right? Now you're becoming influenced by certain things, music, politics. Talk well, about how you might. As a as a boy, in like even in elementary school. I was influenced by two important things. Um, politics, as you mentioned, my mom was real involved in the Democratic Party. Uh, I, I knew we, used, we would be the only people on our block, probably even including your family, although I'm not sure about that, but would always get the Democratic signs up early, <laughs> and then all the Republican signs would come up. Um, I, worked, I was president of something called Kids for Kennedy. We both went downtown, this little group, almost all from our neighborhood. On buses, on you know, on Saturday, and we also would walk the neighborhoods during the the John Kennedy elections, uh, and um, so that was that mattered to me a lot. I mean, I remember watching you know uh, 
Estes Kefauver uh, become the nominee? Now, that's somebody you don't know, a senator from Tennessee, the vice presidential nominee. I, I, it, when Stevenson, L.A. Stevenson was get the nomination, it was really big in my house, in, in my home, not so much among my friends. Uh, and I, I continued in politics. I <clears throat> eventually, uh, I ran large campaigns. I ran campaign, a statewide campaign in Texas, and I almost ran for a statewide office. So that always mattered to me. I, I, I moved to D.C. It was, it was probably the biggest thing I did. I moved to D.C. and started something called the National Jewish Democratic Council. Not the biggest thing, but it, it, it went on for a long, long time, many, many years. Um, so I was involved in that, and I was involved in politics in the state, very close to a lot of political people. Um, it was kind of in my blood. The second thing that was maybe more important, and certainly equally important, was, the, was this great love of poetry. I wrote it, I read it, I adored it. Um, I, I think the principal person that I think, you know, I think in my head was my seventh grade teacher, a woman named Mrs. Bradford who read a lot of Frost to us. She, she had a little farm, she and her husband, and we'd go out there, but um, you know, she wrote The Death of the Hired Man. I don't know if you've read that poem, but it's this gorgeous poem, and I remember from that day, even before, I knew that somewhere between poetry and justice, my life was, it needed both, but both of those were gonna be part of it, and it certainly, it certainly came from here. I still, it certainly started here. Seventh grade, so that was still Kramer, or was that junior? That was Kramer. Kramer. Benjamin Fr no. Kramer. Okay. That was Kramer. Great. Those are great. Politics and poetry, great influences. And was there any specific, any anything that impacted your life specifically that went like a major event in those years, junior high, high school, um, that you can think of that changed? I mean, you're into big, into politics. And, and how did you become, I know you said it's in your blood or it's in your family, was there anybody that specifically helped you with that or uh, carried you along the way or gave you that guidance? <clears throat> the only person who had a, a sort of a similar view of politics was my mom. Um, and she was real involved in, <clears throat> in democratic politics. Not, not so much in leadership roles, but she was a Kennedy woman or girl, I guess, back in the in 1960. And, uh, there was no, there was no, you know, in, in, the, in my household, everybody was a Democrat, no matter what. I mean, you didn't get to not be a Democrat. But Kennedy had a special impact on most of them. I, I was actually at the 1960 convention, a kid, but I was deeply, deeply for Johnson because he was from Texas, and my mama was from for Stevenson. And I think we had a Kennedy person in the house somewhere, but it, it was big in my house. Okay. Well, thank you. So, uh, when well, when Kennedy was assassinated, I mean, how did that affect everybody in your house, yourself included? It was huge. I mean, I um, I was uh, my mother had taken me. I was in tenth grade, and I, my mother had picked me picked me up and from high, from Hillcrest High School, and with another friend of hers and their kids, we went to see Kennedy come into Love Field. Uh, to, it was a, it's it's still hip around. Yeah, it was a the airport in Dallas at the the main airport then. And um, and we went to eat, and um, Kennedy leaving out, walking out, the guy behind the counter. Dallas was a very right wing city, which it isn't anymore. Uh, the the guy behind the counter said the president was killed. My mom, who was this beautiful woman and didn't really have much of a temper, lost it because she just thought it was this constant, you know, this constant group of people who hated Democrats, hated Kennedy, hated Stevenson. So she said, you're, you're just a liar, but he wasn't a liar, and it was, I, I, even I could see that she had overreacted, but not, I understood the reaction. And then it turned, now she, you know, she almost like on autopilot, she, they, they drove us back to school. I remember walking into the school and, you know, um, Billy, Billy, I can't remember, he died of AIDS actually, Billy, Great looking kid, you know. He said, "Isn't it great that Kennedy died, got killed, got shot? He didn't get die." And I, I remember hating that guy until I saw him, like, like a, twelve years later at the tenth reunion of my high school class, and I said, "You know, I said, Billy, I have to tell you, I've had this against you since tenth grade." And Billy <laughs> looked at me, and I told him what he did, and he said. And I hadn't seen him in a long time. He kind of went to another high school. So he, he says, Steve, I just have to tell you, I'm nothing like that. I mean, I'm like, 
you know, I, I really, I do only progressive things. I'm friends with Glenn Maxey, who was the only gay legislator. Um, I just remember that whole thing, and he kind of, he kind of came unglued, but it kind of brought me back to that moment where I was in this nightmarish place where everybody hated Kennedy, and it didn't make any sense to me. I never hated anybody in that way. Wow. So that did impact you. So here is Dallas, is this right-wing white city. Right, um, where, where I live. Where you lived. Yeah, there's a lot where of black people in that city. Right, South and Latino, Dallas. And Latino people. Right, and Latino people, but it was mostly dominated by the uh, the Republicans. And you know, here you are, a Jewish kid growing up, and you go back to Kaplan saying, We're the outliers, we're the outsiders, right? And you kind of were, right? I mean, we kind of were. And you. You've taken it, and here you are going through high school now, Kennedy shot. Some people are happy about that. It was a constant about Kennedy, Kennedy, you know. Uh, so that impacted your, your life. Your mom, you told me a story about your mom. And, yeah, uh, when I was about 10 years old, she took me down to South Dallas. We, we campaigned. We would walk, pre walk in, up to people's houses a lot, but particularly she took me down to an African-American a housing project down in South Dallas, and we were walking together, and suddenly we weren't. I couldn't find her, and there wasn't any danger. Nobody, nobody thought of danger. Okay, it wasn't like the way the world worked a few years later, and uh, I couldn't find her. And I was running around, and you know, I declared she was lost, and I didn't know what happened. And suddenly, I started to hear this. Uh, I started to hear these women talking, and I was following the voices, and. I, I walked into this courtyard, of a, housing projects tended to have courtyards, and there was a group of 10, 15, not 20, women, all African American except for my mom, they were drinking tea and laughing. And <clears throat> I began to cry. Because I realized how much the world was the same, and how good people were everywhere. And it had about more impact on my view of race relations than all the theories I've learned and all the things I've expostulated over the years. And that particular experience just melt molded me. And we could all sit around and drink tea. That's great. That's a great story that you told about your mom. And yeah, very touching. She's a great, great teacher. She was That's great. Teacher. So now you are off to college, so tell me where did you go to college? Uh, I went to the University of Michigan for the first two years. Um, it was a really great experience, except I, I, I didn't come out at the time, but I became um, aware in, you know, in a heart, in a way of my, of my homosexuality, my gayness. Uh, and I didn't come out, but I knew I had to deal with it, and I became very um, unhappy my sophomore year, uh, you know, literally depressed. And um, I, had, I came back to Dallas and spent one year at SMU, and I saw a psychoanalyst here. And um, he was a great man, and he really helped me along. And then I finished my last year at the University of Texas. Um, and. Uh, that was pretty cool, and I was really involved in left-wing politics, liberal politics. It was a time of left-wing politics all over the country, and I would be involved in running elections, which I did. And we we took over the city. Where there, I was. I was remember, our group was called the Coalition for a Progressive Austin, and my my dad, who was you know a progressive. I mean, I loved that man, and he you know he died fairly young. Uh, but I remember when, when Allende was killed in Chile, I called my father because I knew he he feel the same way I did. But we took over the city and we got written up, and I was actually written up about it in the Wall Street Journal. So I, I, my dad calls me up and says, "Now my friends respect what you do, <laughs> not because of the nature of the but because they were all far to the right of my father." But, but he said, "Now you're in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You're like an important person." <laughs> so I was like, "I was like a great funny story to me, um, you know, because I was in like, cool. I didn't actually. It was a time when everyone was trying to get into this article because this guy was, in, and I got to be the center of it." And I was trying to get to stay away from the guy because it sounded wrong to me to want to be in a newspaper article back then. To in my my in my 
insides didn't feel like the right thing to push for. So he, he got more interested in me because I wasn't, I wasn't trying to find him. He was trying to find me. Um, what did you study in college? I studied a ton of history, and I say it that way because my transfers from Michigan to uh, SMU to Texas, in Texas at that time, you had to have 24 hours of your major at Texas. So I, my senior year, I just studied history like craziness so that I could graduate and get a Bachelor of Arts in history um, because I loved history, and um, I still do. And then um, after college, I took a year and off. Uh, part of it was after seeing here in Dallas, the psychiatrist, great guy, um, I hitchhiked around America. I left home with about 10 bucks in my pocket and hitchhiked and uh, came back. And um, I couldn't, I, that's when I, and, I, and that's what, why I went to Texas, because I needed that time to hitchhike. And I grew a lot of confidence, a lot of, I'd get into these cars, and there was a lot of wonderful people, and there were some crazy people. Um, I almost got killed going from um, Chicago to Ann Arbor, which was the, the place I went to college as a sophomore. I also spent about six months and started a group here at the, at the Jewish Community Center, and it was called, what was it called? It was, anyway, it, it was a group of like a hundred high, Jewish high school kids, and um, I can even name some of the people that did it with me. None, nobody you probably know. There's somebody I close to on Facebook, and she, you know, we still keep close. We don't see each other. She lives here. First name is Norma, but um, she was. I was dating her at the time. Gay as I was, I was dating her. But anyway, um, I'd get up every morning and take like uh, 10 kids, six kids, whatever, down to either a Latino or an African American housing project, and we would serve breakfast to those kids. And one of the really fabulous stories that really does have a little bit of Dallas history so, is uh, there was one prominent woman who really was scared to death of this project. And she was demanding that there be a meeting of the mothers so they could talk about this project. And it was here at this Jewish center. It was a much smaller Jewish center, but it was the same geographic place. And, um, you know, I could give you all the names, but I'm not going to. But the, the, there's this very wealthy businessman, a meatpacker, and his daughter did twice a week. It means she had to get up at four in the morning. Uh, and it, something wrong? So she, she, so he calls me up and said, Steve, you know, do you need me to come to this meeting? Because I hear there's a meeting. And um, I said, Mr. Blank, it would be really great if you did come because I think there might be some controversy and it would be really wonderful to have you in the room. And so the woman that was leading the charge to stop the project, she was saying, we're gonna, the kids are going to get killed and they're going to fall down and, you know, the... Hillcrest High School was where most of the kids came from. It was, it was the Panthers. So there was Black Panthers were, the, were like a big thing. The Black Panthers were this movement. So, so somehow the newspapers, the Times-Herald, <laughs> conflated the two. And so these Panthers are going, you know, they're these young Jewish Panthers. And so it was, and there was no Black Panthers. There was any African-American people doing the same work we were doing, so we were feeding them. So anyway, these poor people in the housing project. So this man stands up and... He said, well, you know, I've got to say something. And I, I was taken aback because, you know, I would speak emotionally, and I always have about how these kids were growing and learning and getting to So he stands up, he says, you know, I don't know so much about this. I, I love it when Steve talks like this, but the truth of the matter is, I don't really care if they're learning. What all I know is my daughter is getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning twice a week. Kids don't do that. To go down and serve some people who need it some food and, you know, I think it's a good thing. I think if she gets knocked down, she'll get back up and she'll grow from it. But what I'd like to say is, and he mentions the woman's name, Blank, you have said your piece, and now I have said mine, and I would like, you know, the only business person in the room and had a lot of respect, he said, I think we should just get on with the business at hand. I mean, if you don't want your kids coming, just take them out. And nobody did that. Nobody. And he comes up to me afterwards and he says, Steve, 
how much meat do you, and I'm a vegetarian now, but I ate meat then. He says, how much meat do y'all need? And I told him what we needed. He says, what if every two weeks I have, you know, let's, for the sake of the number, 15 pounds delivered to the Jewish Community Center, and you guys, that's, that'll be enough for the two weeks the way you're explaining it. Um, is that be okay? I, so it, was, it was really a great, great time of learning how things can happen. That's fantastic. You're impacting other people now, right, at that time. Here you are. How old were you? 20, I was graduated college. So 20 years old, now you're starting to impact other people. Right. I suppose I don't know. Yeah, I, think I, I, I was very. I, I still love some of those people. I know some of those kids are not kids anymore. They weren't that much younger than me. Well, they wouldn't have had that meat without you. Oh, those kids. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that was helpful to them that too. That was very helpful. I was thinking of the people that actually got up in the morning and did it. I thought that was really that, great to watch that, all these high school kids doing it. Absolutely. So here you are, graduated Texas, traveling around the country, hitchhiking. Right. I hitchhiked a lot around, around America, around Europe. Uh, I was a hitchhiker around Northern Africa. I did. I hitchhiked with no money a, a lot. Right. Fabulous experiences, good, bad, you know. That you there had. were a lot. I, I hitchhiked once with uh, in Europe, and, and we didn't go together all the time, but Mark Shore, who is one of the people in the classic, and you know, one of my best friends, we would uh, we hitchhiked all over Europe, and... I don't think he went to. Yeah, we were we were in Morocco together. There's great stories about that Moroccan sphere. I just thought about. Um, but we worked together all the time. We just meet. Um, and how did you communicate? How did you do that? I mean, right now you got cell phones, right? You text somebody, "Hey, I'll be in Morocco." But how do you do it? <laughs> you do it. How'd you do it then? We did. <laughs> there was no real way to communicate, but by letter. I mean, you know, I guess I don't think I got on the phone once with my parents. And Mark and I certainly didn't. How do we get? I think we would plan on where we would meet. We, I don't know how we did it, but we we definitely met. We met in Bordeaux. Uh, we met in Spain. And we met again and we hitchhiked in Ro from Rome. And I remember in Athens, I got all my money stolen, and I think he gave me some money. I was in bad shape. Well, you, you can tell us any stories you want about that time if you'd like. If not, I'll, I'll go through. How, how did you keep your Jewish identity through this, or uh, was it a part of what you wanted to do? I it's mean, integral. It's not even, it wasn't ever not part of me. Uh, you know, it was big to me. Like, I didn't, I, you know, Mark and I went to a, I think he did. I know I did, to like a, to, go, to try to find a Passover meal. I'm not sure we got, I think we got sick trying to find it in Madrid. There weren't any Jews in Madrid, to be honest, at the time. They, were, they, really, they really purged that city of Jews, or the Jews purged themselves of Madrid. I don't know, but uh, I'd look for Jews. You know, Jews are big to me. I mean, I'm a Jew, and it matters a lot, you know, so I'm, I'm not a, it's, it's a big thing to me. Okay, and so you're traveling around. Was there a time where you thought, okay, I'm going to go to law school? Oh, yeah, when I left, I, I figured... I'd go to law school. I applied after I, before before I took the trip um, and after I took the year, year off it was more, more like a year and a half off to, uh, to do the youth volunteer service corps. That was what it was that was here at the Jewish Community Center, um, and um, that was the name of it. And um, it was mostly Jews. We didn't, you know, we, there were some Christian kids in it, but it was mostly Jewish kids uh, here. But um, I, I I knew I wanted to go to law school. Um, and I did. <laughs> I came back and I um, I applied to like three schools. I didn't. I didn't. I got into the University of Texas law school. I got into another law school, um, maybe University of Pennsylvania. And then I didn't get into uh, Harvard, which is you know. Which I, I, but everybody here told me that if I didn't get into something like Harvard. And Texas was like one of the top ten schools in the country. They said, you really want to go to Texas if you're going to live here, which I assumed I'd live all my life, which I didn't. So I wound up going to Texas and um, been in law school, kind of boring, and I um, got really involved in politics in, in Austin. I mean, just overly involved in politics uh, during that time. So what, what years were those that you were in law school or in Austin? I was in law school from about 70, no, let's see. 71 through 75. I didn't, I didn't graduate from law school. Yeah, I graduated about seven. 
I didn't graduate till 77. I had to take one course. After, I, after law school, I went around the world for a year. I hitchhiked all over the world. But I had to take a course. I, I, I finished what was required to take the bar, but I had to have a course to have actually graduated. Okay. So I didn't graduate till 77. So in this period, 1971 to 75, um, you're in Austin. You say you got really involved in politics. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's when we took over the city. We, we, we won the, we won the uh, 75 election, the council elections, uh, from the conservatives. Um, we were, you know, belittled. I think most of my friends in Austin were working in the in the campaigns to do that. Uh, it was the Coalition for Progressive Austin, the CPA. So you're and talking about city council. You took over city, the city council. council. We took over that city and uh, with our slate, and um, it was pretty cool. And like yeah, I said, I was written up, and we 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 beat a we we lost by a few hundred votes in nuclear power um, election. Um, the the powers that be were like really nervous about our group when one of the great mayors said, I hope we can flush. No, it was, it was a, the great mayor was just, nervous. he said he, he, he hoped I'd leave, Mayor Butler. But then there's this woman, Betty Hemmelblau, and she said, I wish we could flush Steve Gutierrez down the toilet. Because they were, we, were, it was a, we were against the sewage growth because we didn't want Austin to keep growing. Is, <laughs> Okay, well, I can't believe a mayor would say that, but I, uh, it wouldn't, this is the No, 90s. he didn't say about suing me. It was Mrs. Himmelblatt that said she was going <laughs> to okay. flush me. Flush All right. you. Yeah, it was pretty. Well, yeah, what do you mean you couldn't believe a mayor would say that? Look at the, what they tell us they people say today. Well, yeah, that is 30 or 40 years later. I mean, right. that, but I'm glad that you got him out. I mean, uh, that you took over the city. That's fantastic. So you're still that outsider, right? I mean, you're still coming in. Here you are from Dallas, Texas, took it to Austin. You live with that. I, I was an outsider, but you know, I also believed everyone had to get along with each other and like each other. And I always believed that much to my, I wasn't a radical. I was a idealist, and I was accused of that by the radicals. He's an idealist. It's, like, we can't, we can't accuse him of doing this for some other reason. But I, uh, I did, I really wanted everyone, to, I wanted society to work, and I still do. I mean, it's, it's always been a part of me. Okay, so now after you, got through with law school in 1975, you, you went again, again, to travel around the world, I went around hitchhiking the world. or different different way? Well, I bought a trip, uh, uh, like I bought a flight, you know, from Los Angeles, I hitchhiked to LA, and then I went to, I went to, uh, I went to Tahiti from Los Angeles, had an amazing time in Tahiti, you know, I was by myself, and I loved it, actually, and I'll tell you amazing stories, but I won't. Uh, and then we, I went to Fiji and had even more amazing stories, like where, you know, I almost got, I landed in a town called Nandi, and this lady, they took me to this little place called Latoka, which was actually a little bigger than Nandi, and they tried to rob me, and I left. And then I, I went to this village called Reiki Reiki, and uh, I remember there was a, there was a, um, a, a king, so-called king, trying to entice me to be with him, and um, this guy George Amusi takes me aside, big guy, and he says, "You don't want to go with the king. He he wants to do bad things to you." So he said, "But I, my family and I live in this little village called Pitawa, and not too far down, such and such. You know, you can get to it by hitchhiking." And I, um, I said, well, "You know, I said I'm really too nervous. It's, I've had a hard." couple of days. Look, so I decided I wanted to get to um, the capital of, and stash my stuff, my backpack. And then I went and I spent a wonderful time in this village of Itawa. And I, and I had an amazing story happen to me there, which I'll share. Um, Tommy was one of the three kids. Jimmy was the oldest boy. And he was the prince at some Easter festival or some festival. But uh, Tommy was asking me what my religion was, and I was trying to explain it to him. And when he finally understood about it was Israel, and then these were all Assembly of God people, Assembly of God is how they said it, and they, he jumped on the floor in the form of a being crucified, and he started shaking. It wasn't, he was 10, I mean, he wasn't like a 20 year old making a joke, he was scared. And I said, Tommy, it's just me, it's just Steve. 
I mean, he was by himself in the in the. It, it wasn't a house. It was like it was a house, but it was you know like a, a hut, um, grass hut. And he goes and he started to smile, and I I thought. This is how you make peace in the world. Because he got up and hugged me. He realized that whatever he had thought, that we had killed Christ, that he no longer was seeing me as the killer of Christ because I was just Steve. Great story. I like it. Fantastic. So <laughs> just I have one question about hitchhiking. At this time, hitchhiking was a big thing. I know my brother said that. It, so you're doing it. So this is, was the way of life, right, for a lot of people. was hitchhiking. <laughs> For you, of course. But. I hitchhiked around Australia. I hitchhiked around New Zealand. Uh, I think when I got to... I'm not sure that I... I didn't hitchhike in India. I didn't hitchhike in... I don't think I hitchhiked in Nepal. I don't think I hitchhiked again until Israel. Um, um, I, went, I went to Burma then. I, de I definitely took trains in Burma. Amazing experiences in Burma. I had great experiences in Indonesia, in, in, in uh, Bali. But I wasn't hitchhiking in Bali. You've been to countries that aren't even called Burma and Rhodesia. <laughs> well, I didn't go to Rhodesia. Oh, I thought you said that. Uh, no, I, if I said that, I didn't mean that. Um, I didn't go to that. I only went to Morocco and Africa. But, no, but um, Burma, just so you'll know, if you're, if you're worried about the way they're treating the, the Muslim minority group there, you still, people still want you to call it Burma because they see Myanmar, the name of it today, is really part of the the, the tyrannical Buddhist regime that, that is killing a lot of Muslims. Which, by the way, is an interesting story because, you know, no one thinks of, Bur of, of Buddhists can also be, you know, look, it's a peaceful, wonderful religion. They can also do evil things. And I, you know, what they're doing right now in Burma or Myanmar um, is pretty awful to these people. So tell us about some of your work or some of your projects, civic organizations that are memorable to you, if you'd like to uh, talk about that. This is after college years, um, before you started working perhaps as a lawyer. Uh, you can well, talk about that. I, I came back and my dad was dying, so I kind of ran the business for a little while till my sister and her husband came up and ran it. And then I, three friends and I, four of us, opened a law firm in Dallas, and it was called Albuck Guto and Bloom or something like that. And um, I mostly did that. Uh, I was real involved in the city. I was um, on many committees, city committees, county committees, a lot, a lot involved in the environment. And then in 83, I took, I, I was chairman of the, cheer, chairperson of something called, I, they, have, they have it still, the Jewish Community Relations Council. And it was a very, you know, important organization in the city. Um, and um, I saw how we would make sure that the Congress members from Dallas and also in Houston and also in Phoenix, they all voted pro-Israel on some of the issues. And I was, dis I was saddened by the fact that when you, that the, this, this area, I mean, the five states of, six states, of Arizona, New Mexico, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma, um, kept foreign aid. Almost, we almost didn't get foreign aid. Now, it wouldn't be just foreign aid to Israel, it was foreign aid, period, because it was all the same bill, uh, because of the votes of the congressmen here. So somebody approached me about taking a leave of absence from my law practice in the 80s and starting uh, the APEC region, which they didn't have then, for the Southwest. So I did. I moved to Austin. They didn't, they, you know, obviously, the two titular cities were Dallas and Houston, but there's also New Orleans and Phoenix. And a little, I mean, most of the, there aren't big cities in Arkansas, uh, big cities of that kind, New Mexico. Um, but anyway, I, so I, I really did. I went all over this area, met the Jews in all these little towns. Um, I was still a part partner in my law firm, but it was a, you know, I could always, APEC, and the agreement was I could only put a certain amount of time in, and I had an agreement with my law firm. It all, it all had to work out, so it worked. And I did it for about two and a half years. We, we really organized Jews everywhere, all these little towns, and it was so wonderful to watch them. They had, they, nobody had ever come about this. They'd come to get UJA money or Federation money to these little Odessas and Roswell, New Mexico's and Seminole, Oklahoma. I mean, there's 12 Jews and they're trying to get whatever little money they could possibly get out of them. But we said, you're really important because there's a congressperson. And 
one of my favorite stories was the, the first place that I went to was um, a congressman named Hall, Ralph Hall, and he was Tyler in Longview, and he was a conservative Democrat, and they told me in, in Washington, APAC told me, you can't get him, he's, an, you know, he's not going to be for us, he's not going to, they said worse things, but, and I just started organizing Longview and Tyler constantly, I was out there, and we finally had the meeting. And I remember, which was the right thing for them to want, they said, we're not doing this without you. So I said, it's better if he just thinks it comes from you. So we, we met, and I'll never forget it, because Congressman Hall was supposed to be somebody we'd never get. And he came to this meeting, and, you know, we all talked, and we really planned how we were going to talk and what part, I, you know, the, what part the outside agitator, which was me, would have in the meeting, which the part was made sense, I think. And um, at the end of this, he looks at this table in this law firm and he goes, um, Izzy Rouge, too, I'm sure people know still, it's one of the great oil families of East Texas. He said, Izzy, you've supported me all my life, all my life. Um, you've given me money as much as you could give. And Norman, you're the mayor of Tyler. You, you, you do my politics in Tyler. And he went all around the room. He said, you all have never asked me to vote for foreign aid. You've never asked it, not once. You've never asked me till today when, when Steve has asked me to go to Israel, and I will marry Ellen and I. I'll go to the APEC policy conference. I never ever thought. I mean, Y'all didn't say this is important to you. I don't care what people in Washington tell me. I care what you tell me. And the guy became very pro-Israel. He said, I'm a, Demo I'm a conservative Democrat, but I'm not an ideologue. If foreign aid means this much to you, I'll vote for it. And he did. And that's a great story because it really impelled me on all the rest of that two and a half years of organizing, and we changed the vote, I don't say me, but we changed the vote to people there from 37 to 14 against foreign aid, because they didn't want to spend money. It wasn't, they didn't, it wasn't even like today, it wouldn't be because we hate foreign aid. Just, why wouldn't we spend money on that? To 37, 14 for it, and the vote be, went from a very close vote in the Congress to a pretty big one. We, you know, we had a big margin, because that's a big change. So it, it really taught me a lot about organizing and a lot about how you really go down to where the people are. Fantastic stories. And, and ask for it, right? And ask for it. And what? And ask for it. Yeah. You have to ask for it, right? You have to ask for it and you have to show that you care. And they don't want to know <coughs> people in Washington want. They want to know people in Tyler want. Tyler constituents want. Is that the same today? Probably to an extent, really. Probably to an extent if you really were talking. You know, I, I, I have to think it. I have to think that if you're, you know, you seem doubt, you seem all the cities here as people have, grow, have gotten up and grown. They've gone from quite Republican, where people just used to talk to business people, to Democratic. And you've seen out in the country where people really started listening once the uh, evangelical churches started organizing in the '90s. They went, they went from. Um, basically Democrats to Republican because they were they, they started realizing the politics of abortion and the politics that they they, they had control of those of the members of Congress and whether the place was dead. So I think people do listen and I think I think we should all listen to each other. I don't I, I think that's the, the weakness of today is people only listen to one side. And I'm not sure that was tr true a long time ago. There were a lot of moderate conservative Dems there were a lot of moderate Republicans. I mean, there were. I mean, yeah, that, that's, not even, that's not even a mythology, I'm saying. People were different. They didn't just assume you were X or Y. Yeah, the listening part is a, is a key, too. It is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a couple more things. Uh, you mentioned early in our interview you became a rabbi. Can you talk about that, how, you wanted, how that came about and why you wanted to do that? When, when I was a, a boy, like nine years old, I read a book of, called the Richard Halliburton's Book of Marvels, and there were about maybe 15 great places in the world that were really strange and wondrous. But the one that took my heart away was a place called Angkor Wat, which is in Cambodia. And I felt like I was supposed to go there, so that's, that's number one. I felt like I was supposed to go there all my life. Um, I, um, when I hitchhiked around the world, I was in New Zealand, and I remember I had a, a dream. And I woke up in Auckland, and my friend Mark Perlmutter told me his wife at that time, she was also, she's also a friend, Diane, was waiting for us at Angkor Wat, and he had an airplane 
Why, why they really aren't into the world I'm in right now, this, at this idea of Angkor Wat. To take me there, take the two of us there, and he was taking us. So we went, and Diane had, Diana had, had, a, Diane had a lunch at, in the, this cave that doesn't exist, but in my dream it did. And then, as I, as I went to Washington, uh, set, you know, many years later, and started the National Jewish Democratic Council, um, I decided, I kept feeling, hey, I started to feel like the po remember I said poetry and justice or politics or power, whatever you want to call it. I felt the poetry was, I was losing it. I felt like I was seeing you and said, what can, I, what can he do for me? What can she do for me? Uh, I became utilitarian in how I was looking at people. And I, I started to hate this me because it wasn't me. And I knew that Washington had shifted me. And I really, was, I mean, the organization was going on. But I, I just really realized that I wanted to get at it. I wanted to learn. So I went, I oh, was going to eventually be a trip to Israel with this party chair, a Democratic party chair and a bunch of state chairs. But I met um, a guy that I had been, you know, probably the person I was closest to in my life. Uh, he's a Buddhist. And we met in uh, Bangkok. And we went to Cambodia. And we went to see Angkor Wat. And we saw all these places where they killed all these people, whether it be the Killing Fields or this high school in Phnom Penh, which is the capital. Uh, and they just destroyed people there, uh, little babies. And I came back after, and I went to, I, and I, and Angkor Wat, which just overwhelmed me, um, which is in a little town called Siem Reap. It's not in, it's not in Phnom Penh. And um, I came back and I wrote this piece to, letter to myself, and it said, politics, philosophy, religion, all is night. Only an open heart has any consistent meaning. And I decided to find a way to live my life with an open heart. So I winnowed through what I had to winnow through, which meant you know, I needed to work in the 60, 96 election. I was the, I was the, uh, what's the right word? Uh, I, I ran the coordinated campaign for the state of Texas, which is all the Democratic things. It's, it happens in most big states. There's a Democratic coordinated campaign and a Republican one, because you basically have to get the same people out to vote, so why should each candidate be doing that? Um, and, um, but I, I, I applied to, I was going to go to a, to, I couldn't go to, the, I couldn't make sense of a conservative rabbit because not only was it anti-gay, but it was also anti, I mean, I, I just don't believe in halakha, Jewish law as being controlling. I mean, I think it's important stuff, and we should know it real well. I just don't think we should. Jew, to be a good Jew, you have to do that. And I think to be a good conservative rabbi, you have to have a, a stronger view of Holocaust than I do. Uh, so I, um, I went to the Reconstructionist Rabbinical School. It, it overwhelmed me. It was, felt like going back into the womb at, late in life. I was in my 50s by this time. Um, and, but, it, but it really had a lot to do with Washington becoming very utilitarian in Washington and lose, losing the, my, my poetry feeling. I was losing it, which I didn't ever want to do. And secondly, it had a lot to do with um, Angkor Wat, with the mystical reality, the almost epiphany. I mean, it wasn't an epiphany like I, somebody came, but it was like I, I went there and I knew that my life had to be different. So that's, that's why I chose to become a rabbi instead of uh, continuing as a lawyer or a political organizer, or those things which, you know, still, they all make sense to me, but that's not what I wanted to be. From nine years old, that's unbelievable. It's from nine years old, that's unbelievable. That, that that place was in my head as a place I had to get to. And reading it in a book, you saw that. Richard that. Albert's book of Marvel's Kid. It was written in 1936. I was before before either one of us were born, uh, and he had gone to these different places all over the world. But that particular place took me took my breath away. Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. That somebody could write something that powerful that you could read. I don't know what I feel like now reading it. I don't even know, you know, this, I don't know, I just know what it did to me then. So where did you go, where was rabbinical school? I, you know, I, so I was thinking of going to the reform school because I said I couldn't be a conservative rabbi. And then um, my friend said, you know, your, the truth is Reconstructionism is ritually closer to conservative. Um, it came from conservative Judaism. Mordecai Kaplan, who started it, was a great conservative sociologist scholar uh, who taught at, J at the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the flagship, certainly was then, of the, of the conservative movement. And um, 
when I started reading about Reconstructionism, there was this book by a guy named Arthur Green, who's kind of a mystical Jew, who had been president of the Recon Reconstructionist College. I, I felt like that was, I thought it was for me. And I went up there, I went up there, I'd, 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 from the Texas experiences of running that campaign and stuff, I, I uh, was here in Texas, in Austin, but I felt like I needed to go see it at least. And so I, I, I burst, I was crying when I got there. Um, Rabin had just been killed uh, the night before, and the kids, which I think I saw myself as one, you know, were so emotional, uh, and they were singing, and this is where I needed to go find my soul. And it was a great six years, and I loved it. Okay, well that's good. I'm glad you did what you, you found your soul. I did. It was always there, but I seemed to seemed to couldn't find it. Maybe it was lost. For it was a time. kind of lost somewhere. It was it was in this utilitarian. What can I get out of you world that I had, well, I'd become part of, and was a good representative. I thought, you know. And now, as a rabbi, do you practice? Uh, you know, are you a member of a shul? Uh, yeah, I, I right after rabbinical school, I was the I was the pulpit rabbi of a small Reconstructionist synagogue in St. Louis, and. Um, I, I didn't really, it, did, it didn't really work for me for many reasons. Um, it's a good place. It's, a, it's an excellent place. And I knew after the contract ended, I was going to need to go and find another place. I, I, I something, a little different canvas. Of, you know, there was a lot, synagogues are difficult places. There was a lot of people that don't like each other. And even though everybody, at least then, seemed to like me, it was just a couple of years, I couldn't take the, the, this, like, frat, this, anyway, without getting any more than that, I started looking around at different things, and um, I called a friend of mine who was running an organization, a big national organization, it, it is still the organization that's the head of all the community relations councils in the country, and the only organization that's also six, all the, all the major religious movements, the ADL, the American Jewish Committee, the National Council of Jewish Women, there's like 16 national organizations, and it's, job is to help formulate national, um, the, you know, also the Orthodox Union. The, it, was, it wasn't a, a, a right or left wing organization, it was really a center organization. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, it, it worked and they wanted me and I wanted them. And so I spent 10 years, or a little more than 10 years as the executive of that organization until about 2015, where what I had, garnered from this time was that there was one pe per, one group of people I felt very close to that most of my friends felt were a little bit off limits and those were fundamentally white evangelicals and I knew so many of them had great such great hearts and um, I got to, I was part of a I actually co-chaired something with an evangelical leader uh, we would meet for two we still do it will be our 12th year meet in Washington 20 of us 20 of them and talk about every subject under the sun, and there's a lot of teachings there. Um, and um, so I, I wanted to see if I could create these religious groups of the top religious leaders in cities. And so I've been doing this for about two years, and I'm, I, I'm a visiting scholar. Now I'm called a research scholar, don't ask me why, um, at New York University at NYU. And um, I go around and try to create these groups. and. Um, Organize these groups and they create themselves. But I, I, I you know, you gotta have, for the group to work. You have to have a Jew. You have to have a Muslim. You have to have a mainline Christian. You have to have a Catholic, and you have to have an evangelical, a white evangelical, who you know who's perceived as that. And it's going, it's going well. I mean, if you don't talk about abortion and you don't talk about gay rights, um, you can do it. I mean, you know, and, and when they say some some liberals so how do we, you know we we have a different view on those things, Steve? How do we do it? And I said, you don't seem to stop the Catholics. You don't seem to stop the Muslims. You don't seem to stop the Orthodox Jews. You've picked out the white evangelicals who care deeply about having people having homes and they're 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 okay with legislation for it. I mean, why would you know? Or or they want people to have not live in food deserts. Anyway, it's exciting work. But at the age of seventy, I must admit. It's very, you know, it's 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 a lot of energy is in organizing, and I sometimes feel like I'm I'm right there as far as I can be, and I don't know if I, you know, I just don't know, but it's it's going well, so 
I'm good. I'm just visiting here from New York. I live in New York City right now. So that's your passion. It's, you found your soul, and this is part of your purpose, right? This is part of it, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I've always sort of been where my soul is, except that period in Washington. Where I, right, you followed it. I you count followed it. it. So this is the talking and the listening part that comes back, and everybody's got to do that, or you're going nowhere, right? you got to do that. you got to do and that. you got to keep thinking. So this has been an unbelievable interview. Just a couple more questions, then we'll wind it down. Um, I, I know you're not married, no children, uh, but I wanted to ask you um, if you could share advice or you know, if with the next generation of Jewish kids, um, if there's anything you want to leave to them as, as part of this interview, uh, that somebody will look at this down the road and wonder what kind of advice that you would give them. Without, without sounding trite, I would say that friendship, love, passion about the other, um, whether it be your wife or husband or uh, partner or whatever you want to call it, um, or your friends or just the people that walk the hallways or, or, or running the gift store here. Uh, Open your soul. It's it's a good thing for for it, it, this is like doesn't matter about what year you're in. It doesn't matter whether you're in the 21st century or the 20th century or probably at the beginning of time. Just open your heart and 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 uh, and, and go go there and listen and and learn and be there for people when they need you. And there's nothing more important than that. And if you if you if you let that draw you, you will be so much better. I think as a person you'll. You'll love yourself more as you love others more, as opposed to worrying about whether or not you got this goal, you know, you got this accolade, or you got into this club, or people looked up you respectfully. Now, I'm not saying all these things are part of my life too. I mean, these things I don't love. But the the other side is let the side that let the love side win as much as you possibly can, as as much as you're willing, because you'll you'll always do better. I mean, I was talking to a woman in the in the gift store who was having a problem with her daughter. She said, oh, this woman was, I don't know her age, but I guess she was in her 80s, and the daughter was, I'm sure it couldn't be, that, you know, kept at least in her 50s. And I said, you don't, you, you don't want, you want, you want her. And she didn't even know I was. I didn't, I didn't say, I, I did eventually say I was a rabbi, because I, I realized the hoods of me saying, just make it work, you know? I mean, just, what, what do you got to lose here? <laughs> yeah, she said, well, I know you're right. I, I know you're right. And she said, well, I try, but it's really hard. And I said, I know it is. That's what, but you gotta, we all got to keep trying. You got to keep trying. That, that's great advice. I really like that. So there was one question I forgot to ask you. When you became a rabbi, was either your mom or dad alive to see that? Either one. Okay. Uh, no. Um, I became a rabbi in 2003, and my mom had died in 96. My dad had died in, oh man, I'm like 77. Wow. Well, they would have been proud of you, obviously. They were proud of you. I think they thought I was a little crazy, but I, you know, there, there was a piece of them that was also proud of me. I mean, I think they did think, I think my mother, who was quite aware of the rabbi thing, you know, thought, what? <laughs> she goes, what? Like, what is this man doing? He's, you know, he's 50 years old. He's starting rabbinical school. <laughs> he doesn't know Hebrew. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> That's great. Well, is there, I know this is a long interview. Is there anything that we missed that you'd like to touch on? Uh, no, you actually, you actually let me talk about what mattered the most in this interview, uh, both that I think everybody should try to find a synthesis of you know, of, of their passions, of love, and, and also of uh, success, whatever it is. I mean, success can be running a business, success can be, but also love of their family and love of their friends and love of their community. I think I think they have to merge and they have to fight to keep them merged. But you, you got that out of me. And um, so I, I don't really have much more to say. Well, that's great. Steve, I want to thank you for sitting, you know, for this interview with the Dallas Jewish. It was a Jewish pleasure. I, love, I mean, I love you. and. And so, of course, I'm going to love doing this. So thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. I love you, too. And uh, it was it's actually, this is the first time I've done an interview where the sun has shined on you the entire time. And it looks great. And thank really you. Cool. <laughs> thank you once again, Steve. I thank you, it. It's good.